ahead and get started. The meeting is called to order and this is June 18th for the Master Larimer County Master Gardeners membership meeting. First item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes for the May membership meeting. Are there any additions or corrections? And you need to unmute your mic if you want to say something. Okay, I do have one comment on the minutes. Um, I was looking at the report for the speaker series and it looks to me as though that is a copy of the April paragraph because my notes to myself indicated that we had um, reserved the date of April 24th of next year and a room at the Pathfinder building had been reserved but I don't see that uh, indicated in the minutes. So if that would be verified, I'd appreciate that. And the other item that I would like to have added would be, um, no, that's it. Are there any other corrections or additions? Okay, okay. then I need, go ahead. Oh, I'll take care of that. Okay, thank you, Julie. Okay, I need to have a vote. So if you would unmute. All those in favor of accepting the minutes as corrected, please say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. Motion carried. Okay, Susan, do we have a treasurer's report? Um, yes, uh, you may, oh, I, you gotta see me, just a minute. Okay, um, Marie sent out the treasurer's report to everyone and it looks like our unallocated funds as of the end of May 31st is $2,767.92. On June 6th, now this won't show up until the June treasurer's report, but on June 6th, I did transfer from PayPal $6,403.45. Um, and that included uh, $240 in refunds for plants. Um, there were some on Susie's list, some on Becky's list. And then there was, um, those are the refunds that we made via PayPal. So we didn't have to do checks. I was able to um, go through and do that through PayPal. And then also I refunded in June that didn't show up in May. The vendors were refunded their money for a total of $1,405. All that will show up on the June report. It's not on May, it will show up on June. Okay. okay, any questions or comments about the treasurer's report? Okay, hearing none, we'll go ahead and accept that. Okay, the next item on the agenda would be our committee reports. First one would be the adult education with the gardening for success. Catherine, are you back yet from corralling your animals? My yappy coworkers. <laughs> yeah. um, do we have more coming up or have we finished the series? No, I do have some more stuff coming up. And I have on the 24th, on the 24th, I have Chris Hilgert in the, in, again at 6.30. And he's gonna talk about trying to grow fruit trees in Wyoming. And then on the 8th of July, Chris Hilgert will again be back 
uh, in the evening at 6.30 talking about growing raspberries and strawberries. And then on July 23rd, I will have John Conti from UW talking about integrated pest management. And that should be everything from weeds and um, hopefully insects. And, and so integrated pest management is of course starting with the least toxic method and working your way up the ladder until you really have to get something something heavy. But it's, again, it's a good program on integrated test pest management. He's a very good speaker. And that's, right now, that's all I've got lined up. I, I would like to have a couple more speakers in here. So uh, if anyone's feeling brave and has a topic they would love to present, I would love to entertain that and and do a, a program, an evening program with that. So I'm always looking for someone to, uh, to step up and help. Okay, thanks very much. And those are all going to be on the same, um, not your site, but the university site, is that correct for the Zoom? Well, I am, they'll all be recorded and then I share them with Becky and then she posts them also on the lcmg.org. So there's, they're, they're in two places for everybody to find. So they'll be on, on the Laramie County Extension webpage and then LCMG also. Okay, cool, thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda, um, when we were talking about the plant sale, Susie indicated that having a paper copy of the directory was really very valuable. And the current one that we have will be two years old by next year. So we were thinking about putting together a new directory. And she volunteered herself and Maggie McKenzie to work on that. So, um, is there any comments or, or suggestions or ideas about a directory? Is this something that other folks, folks would be interested in or is it just Susie and, and uh... Uh, Marie, my comment is if we all have a PDF of the membership list, there's no reason we can't print our own copies. I don't see any reason to spend the money on a fancy book when we need to update it every year. Okay. Any other comments? Marie, I would agree with Barb. I think that's a great idea. If we could get a PDF every year, that would be perfect. Now by PDF, do you mean just a list? Or do you want um, addresses and phone numbers? Or do you want um, the areas of expertise or interest? Or what type of PDF are you talking about? Well, I think... Go, Go ahead, Sharon. Well, I was just thinking um, that we need, you know, phone numbers, address, name, um, just like we have in the directory now. Beyond that, I, I don't know if everybody would like something else, but I'd like to be able to get in touch with people. So that would be my comments, Marie. Okay. Um, a simple Excel file can be converted to a PDF so that nobody has trouble opening it. Okay, but are you in agreement that all we need is phone number, address, and name? Or is there other? Oh, you need, you need email addresses. Whatever information the members give or are willing to put into a directory. You went through it um, already when, when you did the directory. Um, right. you know, there might be some situations where people don't want their certain contact information in, that'd be fine. But um, yeah, we definitely need email addresses in there. Okay, what about areas of interest? So that if you have a question, you can you know somebody to call that has an expertise in that area. That's fine. Would, would that be helpful? Oh yeah, that would be helpful. And in fact, um, you can sort that kind of stuff easily when it's in a, in a form, an uh, Excel file or something. You could have a second page or more you know addition to the document that that would be sorted by interest so it'd be easy to see how many people know something about tomatoes okay any other thoughts
Well, shall we have uh, some, uh, well, we do have a committee um, that is for the database. So maybe we need to prompt our committee per people to put together this type of a, a database then and then convert it into a PDF. Does that sound reasonable? No comments. Yes, it sounds reasonable. <laughs> This is, the, this is the most difficult part of, of holding a meeting is that everybody is muted. So if you want comments, it's really hard to get comments. Thank you, Barb. I appreciate the comments. <laughs> and you too, Sharon. All right, so we will put that on the agenda for having it completed. What, what are, um, I guess my question is, when are we having new members join us? Is it in January of this next year or have they started classes or I don't know. Do we know anything about that? Well, Marie, I am going to try to do a class, a Master Gardener class next January and you know at L Triple C and then Chris Hilger is going to go ahead and do another online Master Gardener program starting in September. So, you know, I, I, there will be more, hopefully, new people joining us right. as far as an annual meeting and congratulating people on, on surviving <laughs> and becoming Master Gardeners. I'm not really sure. That's kind of up to you guys when you want to hold that. Well, I was thinking more in um, when is the most convenient time to compile all the names for a directory. So if we have a whole mess of new interns, it would be better to wait until we at least have enrollment on that before we uh, publish a um, directory. Well, if, we're, I, I, I wouldn't worry about that. And I think we should just go ahead with a directory. And um, Steve okay. is here with us and, you know, he's most, you know, um, most likely will graduate. I'm not sure where his hours are at. But okay. um, so actually, yeah. we can have it completed any time between October and December, and that would be fine, then, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. L Triple C is still being a little twitchy about groups, and they want some pretty interesting requirements, and they want stuff approved by the health department. And I, I'm not sure if I'm really game for doing all that. So in other words, our annual meeting is uh, probably on hold for its, our usual potluck, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I would think at this time for at, at least until we, we don't have quite so many health department requirements. Right, okay. So anyway, back to the directory. We'll go ahead and um, Susie, are you there? Susie Heller? I guess I didn't see her check in, so. And Maggie's not here either, is she? Okay, I will get a hold of, of those folks and see if they want to go ahead under these circumstances with this type of guideline, and we'll go from there. So thank you for your, your input. Okay, um, do we have a recap on the plant sale and the rose sale? Not without Susie. Okay, and Mary Ann's not here either, is she? Okay. Well, they said they were going to put together a report to see, tell us what worked and what didn't work and successes and failures, and we're looking forward to that then. Thank you, Richard, for your comment. Um, one of the primary things that came out of the plant sale process was that Becky learned that she just simply did not have the skill base necessary to do the sophisticated programming that was needed for making it a smooth online sale. And so we are looking for somebody who has the skill in web design and programming that could 
take over those duties in the future. So if you know anybody, um, or if you're interested yourself, we would love to hear from you. Is there anyone out there right now that might be interested? Okay, we will pursue that in a different direction then. Uh, Marie? Yes, Sharon. I just had a quick question. Uh -huh. um, I'm assuming that if we get a webmaster, so to speak, that this will, will cost the organization some amount of money, correct? If we were to hire it, yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, I know a gentleman that might be interested. I have absolutely zero idea what he would charge. Um, but I will put him in touch with you if he's interested and leave it at that. Would that be all right? That would be fine. It will give us a starting place, if nothing else. Okay, will do. Thank you, Sharon. You bet. And I forgot to turn on my video. <laughs> well, oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm lucky to get the, the voice going. <laughs> <laughs> well, we appreciate your coming, too, and your comments. So I look forward to hearing from your, uh, sorry, uh, your friend. Okay, um, Mike, I think you'd probably be the best person to talk to on the, the first item of new business. Unless I, I skipped over the unfinished business. Do we have any unfinished business? Okay, the new business. Um, we have county fair coming up and we need to know what kind of participation we can look forward to. Mike, can you address that? Oh dear. Okay, did I overlook that Mike was not here? Yeah, it looks like I did. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, I'm uh, not seeing Mike, but um, Marie, there is a superintendent's meeting for the fair. Uh huh. This Monday at 10 o'clock, or excuse me, at 11 o'clock out at Archer. Mm -hmm. And I will not be able to attend that because I've got another meeting scheduled. But right, my understanding is they're going to have some sort of a virtual fair. I'm not sure what that looks like. And, but I can, I can try to get more information to you guys um, after this meeting. Well, we did have um, a quick report Mike's wife, um, I can't remember her name. Linda Heath. Linda. Right. She gave us a quick a rundown at our executive board meeting. And she was saying that the rules are posted on the, the fairgrounds web, website for the fair. And basically, as, as I recall, anyhow, she said that any exhibits that we have would bring, they take a picture. And then from that point on, it's a virtual fair. But what that entails, I don't know. But she said all of the rules and regulations are on the website. Were you at looking for somebody to sit in on that superintendent meeting for you? That would be that would be great. And I will Try to find the email and send it to you. Okay. Marie? Yes, Sherry? Um, my understanding is that all the exhibits will be judged as they normally are, but the public will only be able to view it virtually rather than going to the exhibit buildings. Ah, okay. That makes sense. 
Um, I have some information. Can you hear me? I hear you, but I don't know which Susan I'm talking to because this I can't is Susan. Read. This is Susan Parkins, and I'm kind of new to the whole Zoom thing. Um, <clears throat> I will be at that meeting because I'm the, one of the superintendents for the needlework division, and um, I talked to Jody Milburn, who who um, it runs the exhibit hall or manages it, and I they're going to do kind of a drop in, drop off, and pick up type of a format. So for needlework, and I'm kind of assuming it might be the same for floriculture that um, you're gonna, people will take the items in and leave them, they'll be judged and then they'll pick them up the next day. Um, as somebody said that they won't be um, uh, available to be, uh, you know, viewed by the public or anything, but they're just gonna be um, taken out and judged quickly and then they're done and people will pick them up. But I will be at that meeting if there's somebody that I can get back to on it. Okay. Um, for sure, touch bases with uh, Catherine. Okay. And if you send it via email, you can give me a copy. Okay. That'd be great. Thank you, okay. Susan. You're welcome. Okay, the next item would be our picnic um, at our executive board meeting. It sounded as though people were interested in having a picnic, but we need to determine several things. First of all, when it would be, since we're not having the um, garden walk in July, we have July available and we also have August, which is the normal time for our picnic, that we can have it. Um, we also need to know where we're going to have it, whether it be in somebody's home or whether we have it at a park. We also need to know um, what is it, uh, everybody bring their own lunch, and that sort of thing. So I need to know from you folks what type of event you would be interested in having. And then if we do decide we want to have it, we need to find people who would be willing to organize it. So I'm open to discussion. And I, don't see where the hand is, so I'll just have to take you as you speak, I guess. I have Susan here. Is Susan wanting to make a comment? No, it's left over from last comment. Okay. Anything else? Anybody else have a, a comment or a thought? Marie, I, I do have the thought that um, health-wise, it would be most reasonable for people to bring their own food so you're not having a, a buffet type of situation. My understanding of the health um, ordinances right now, and will be through the end of, well, I guess it's just the end of June at the moment, is that you cannot have any potluck type things or open food or buffet. So it would have to be a catered lunch of some kind or as you say, bring your own. Right. Okay, any other comments, questions, thoughts? This is Rich, I think we should uh wait until August to have it as our normal time, because that way we'd have a little bit more time for this COVID thing to play out. Okay, good suggestion. Any other thoughts? Are we interested in having a picnic? Okay, I have total silence. So from your total silence, I'm saying thinking that only two people are interested in having a picnic and that's not enough to do it. So unless I have more comments, then we're just going to scrap it. Uh, is there any reason we can't send out an email to everyone and ask if they're interested? and get a consensus? 
no, there is no reason we could not if that's what you'd like to do. Well, I think it might be a good idea to do that to see if everyone's interested. Okay. So um, basically what we need to do is send an email out to everybody asking if they're interested in having a picnic in August. And what else do we need to know from them? Um, at this point, um, where we possibly could have it, if anybody has any suggestions with the COVID thing, um, I do know that they have suggested that if you're having get-togethers, it's better to do it outside rather than in a building. Right. Um, and yeah, the, definitely that um, like a buffet or potluck type thing is not a good idea. Right. So, so bring I don't own. know what, how they'll feel about it in August, but that's the consensus right now. Yeah. Okay. I will go ahead and send out an email and get some kind of a consensus on it. Does that sound reasonable? Sounds great to me. Okay, thank you, Deborah. Okay, the next item on the agenda is that I need three people for a, oh, I'm sorry, Sherry, did you have a question? No, okay. Um, we need a nominating committee um, the Office of Vice President and Treasurer are expiring and we need to have replacements. And we heard very emphatically that our treasurer is not willing to continue on. So we definitely need a treasurer. We also need a vice president because there aren't, there are going to be times this next year when I will be away and somebody will have to take over. So are there any volunteers? Again, I met with a deafening nothing. I've got 30 people out there. Is not that somebody interested at all? Marie? Yes, Sharon. <laughs> I recommend Rich Lewis for this, that he be Thanks on the nominating. Thanks a lot, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll help you, Rich. Okay, you and me. All right. There'll be two of us. <laughs> okay. We, we need can, one. We can we get somebody more. else, too. Yeah. We need one more. We also need some kind of <clears throat> updated directory, Marie, or something that we can work with so that we can look at new people also. Right. So you got two. We need one more person and a and a list. I will make sure you get the list, but I need one more person. Rich and I'll wrangle somebody. Right, Rich? Right on. We'll, we'll twist some arms. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. You let me and you let uh, Julie know who, who you find. <laughs> okay. Okay. And, and this is for the slate of officers um, for the annual meeting in October. Even though we don't have a, a regular potluck meeting, we still will have a meeting scheduled. It might be Zoom like this, but it will be a meeting. Okay, thank you. Okay, I don't have any other new business. Does anybody else other have business to bring up? I have a question. Kathy, yes, go ahead. Can you send me whoever signed up, if anyone, to be on the bulb committee? Because I've got my general plan together and I'd like to discuss it with them. But I don't know who uh, who's on that committee besides me. I did if you're just long enough because I was working on that this afternoon so I could understand what, what we had. Okay, Bob, I have Diane Basham and Tala Collins. And that's it. 
Marie, I would be willing to help on that committee. Okay. Kathy, did you get that? You're, you're muted, Kathy. I can't hear you. Who was the other person besides Diane? Terry Cram. And Tava, Tava Collins. Okay. Thank you. You're very welcome. And when do you think you might have the order blanks and so on ready? Is that the end of September when you do that? No, it's more like middle of June, July. Middle of July. Mm -hmm. okay. So if I need want... some time to work up some enthusiasm for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, anybody has a particular bulb they might be interested in having you order for them, they need to let you know by what, mid-July then? Well, this is for the bulb sale where we do the collections and everything. Right. 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 But if somebody has a favorite that they want to be on that list, they'd let, have to let you know by what time. Well, if they have something they want to order outside of what our sale is, anybody can order from these people. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Steve, I see you have a comment here. Were you wanting to make a comment? to the whole group or did you just want to stop, uh, talk to Rich on your comment? Okay. All right, um, a few announcements um, for everybody that's on a committee, even though you might not be working on that committee again next year, your chairperson has to put together a budget and have it submitted in September so that we can have our budget finished and completed by the end of the year. And it seems to take a long time for us all to get our money put together so that we know what we want to spend and what we can spend. And then the other item I wanted to bring up is that there is the Master Gardener of the Year Award and also the Neighborhood Award available to be given out the application forms are online on our website, but the deadline is August 1st. So if there is anybody special or who has done something special this year that you would like to award them for their activities, um, this, is, this would be a way for them to be recognized. Um, anything else at all? that you want to bring up. Okay, two items. Um, we do not... This is Sharon Guthridge. I just wanted to say that this has to be the hardest thing you've ever done. And I really appreciate that you're leading these meetings so well. That's got to be hard. <laughs> you're pulling <laughs> teeth and you've got little black boxes in front of you. But I think you're doing marvelous. Well, thank, thank you. <laughs> Well, it, it's, it's not been the easiest thing for me to manage, but I'm glad it's coming across all right. It is. Thank Good. you. Good. Um, we did make a change on the executive board meeting date because the first Thursday in, in July is on the 4th of July weekend, and we figured quite a few people would be away. Um, we changed the date to July 9th, which is the next Thursday, but it still is at 530. There is no membership meeting scheduled, so we'll have the month off. Um, but of course, you're going to be getting your um, fair produce growing in good condition, so you can do something with that. Um, that's all I have. So if there's anything and nothing else, um, I will entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting, or if there are no motions and no objections, I'll just go ahead and adjourn the meeting. Okay, meeting. Okay, I move that the meeting be adjourned. I'll second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we adjourn the meeting. Do I need to take a vote or is that sufficient? 
I think that's sufficient, Marie. I think that's sufficient. So, okay, the meeting is adjourned. And we'll see you for a picnic, perhaps. Otherwise, we'll see you in September. And right now, we have the opportunity of listening to Catherine share with us some of the things that she's found in her yard calls. And then following that, we get to see some more pretty gardens. So, Catherine, it's all yours. Okay, thanks, Marie. You bet. So, <laughs> I just uh, came back from a meeting this morning with um, Mark Ellison, the city forester, um, the state foresters, the conservation district, and we're all talking about EAB, which is, of course, the emerald ash borer. And it's, in, it's been found in Fort Collins, and Colorado keeps finding it in more cities. And it's, it's not something that Colorado has got a handle on or can, can really can control. So we are looking for it. And, and so part of being a master gardener also puts the burden of you guys being scouts for prominent pests. And, and so this little tiny insect, and hopefully you can, you can kind of get a feel for this. So this is the little itty bitty hole that it makes. And this is the backside because the backside just shows a little bit better. But this is, this is the little tiny hole that it makes. It's, it's less than a fourth of an inch. It's a D-shaped hole. And then when the bark gets peeled, it's this, these kind of serpentine S-like um, channels or galleries that the larva makes. And, and so again, what it looks like on the outside, I know this is like really hard and it's probably blurry, but you can see the red marks. And so that, that kind of gives you an idea how tiny these little holes are that it makes. And it just really, really makes it challenging to try, see how small that hole is? Oh my heck. So it makes it very challenging to try to actually see the exit hole from the larva and you know the the beetle itself is this little tiny thing and they're right now they're flying Catherine about how large are these uh, beetles well does that give you an idea can you guys even I, see that I can't see it right now I okay. first, I lost the screen oh sorry Deb it's they're about a half they're about a half inch long so okay. again it's not a it's not a big bug it's a little tiny bug and it's like a bright emerald green oh it's a gorgeous emerald it's a shiny shimmering yeah. metallic emerald green yeah when you see it you just can't you just can't miss it yeah and i saw one the other day so they are here you, you think you saw one the other day? I'm sure I did. Where, where at? Um, I live on Avenue C, and it was here at my place. Um, can I send the city forester over? Pardon me? I'd like to send the city forester over to check. Um, okay. Um, actually, it was like here and then gone, and I haven't seen any others. And this was probably about four or five days ago at least. Okay, um, would you send me, just email me your, your mailing address so I can get with Mark? Okay. Because, you know, if, if it's, it may not be your ash tree, but it I don't have might, an ash tree. Right, but it might be your neighbors. Uh, possibly across the street. Yep, it doesn't take much and they're flying now. So send me your email address because I need to let the state forester know because this is a reportable insect. Okay. And that, and that means that, so I, I would tell the state, um, Mark Ellison, he'd come out and look for it, see if he can find it, see if he can find you know evidence on an elm tree that it's there. <laughs> then it's just a whole, a whole process of, of events that take place. Right. And, and if, if it's in Cheyenne, we need to know about that so we can actually start protecting ash trees that are worth protecting. Yeah, this was about 
probably about a half an inch long and maybe an eighth of an inch wide at the most. Okay. Um, and it was like a bright emerald green. And when okay. I saw it, I thought, wow, I wonder if that's what that is. Yeah, and and it doesn't have to be your ash trees or, or in your... Right. I mean, if it's your neighbor's ash or an ash a couple houses down, it, the wind moves them. They, they are pathetic flyers, but they can move about a half a mile. Okay. So... Let's, let's check out that area and see if, if they're there, because if they're there, then we need to tell or, or arborists and people right. who've got ash trees that are actually worth protecting need to start um, treating them. Right. Okay. Yep. So a, a lot of things are going to happen once, once it truly is detected. But email me your address so we can start working on that. Okay. All right. I can do that. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, anyway, um, for the rest of you, again, really, really important that you're, you're looking and you're scouting. For those of you guys who can see this, I know this is tough because it's probably blurry on your end, but it is a, just a tiny little hole. It's D-shaped, and it, again, it, it can be pretty, pretty hard to look at and see. I do have, for anyone who wants one of these little cards, I, I have these little cards I can send out to you. So we can get the information out there, and I've got other material to help you guys identify these, these creatures, but we all need to be looking out for them. And, and again, being a master gardener, that's part of your responsibility of being a master gardener is to be scouting for these things. Okay, sorry for the not so fun news. Catherine? Yeah. Chloe, would they be on the trunk or on limbs too? Uh, they can be on limbs. They're usually up higher in the tree. Oh. So, so being on the trunk is prob not as probable, but more likely higher up. And, and that's part of the problem is that they, they are, they're Hard higher up. Shape. Yeah. So I was looking at an ash tree on Tuesday and practically had to climb the ash tree to look and see what was going on. And that was, uh, that was sporting. So, <laughs> so anyway, ash trees. If you've noticed, a lot of our ash trees are looking really bad this spring. They're not leafing out. They're not, and when they do leaf out, they're looking pretty scurfy. So, so here's what's going on. And, it, and again, it goes back to you guys need to be weather watchers and you need to kind of keep track of what, what's going on weather-wise. So again, I know that you're probably not gonna be able to see this very well, but at the meeting today, the, uh, the intern for the city forester put together this really cool chart of temperatures in April. And so again, paying attention to the weather, if you go back to the fall, we had some warm days in the fall and then we had a sudden freeze. And, and then fortunately it stayed fairly cold out. Well then in April, we had a whole series of days that were in the 50s, 60s, and then, and then we'd have a sudden, a sudden cold spell and it dropped down to 22. And we had one night where it dropped down to six, then it warmed up, then it dropped down to nine degrees. It warmed up, dropped down to seven degrees. Well, this was enough to kill off the leaf buds on a lot of our trees. So you, you notice that the elms look a little, little tatty. Ash trees definitely took it hard. And, and so they actually lost their primary leaf bud. And so now they're trying to reach in for that secondary bud that would have been saved for 2021. And so, so they're really struggling right now. And Mark's suggestion, and I normally tell people, well, if they're not leafed out by Father's Day, then they're probably not going to leaf out. Mark is now saying the middle of July to the 1st of August. So if those trees haven't leafed out, the ash trees haven't leafed out by the middle of July or the 1st of August, they're probably not going to. 
And then the downside of this is that if they do leaf out that late, it doesn't give them enough time to really put on any growth, to put out uh, enough leaf canopy. And it also doesn't give enough time for the new growth to harden off for winter. It doesn't, it doesn't set up, it doesn't have enough time to set up for winter. So it doesn't get a, a tough enough skin or bark. <laughs> or you want to live, I mean, if you live in Wyoming, right, you got to have tough skin to deal with the weather. But it, it doesn't give the tree enough time to really set up for it. And so his concern is that even if it leaves out, winter is going to kill the tree. So it's a really tough year for ash trees, and they're they're just really gonna, yeah, it's not it's not a happy thing. And and Deb, if you think you've seen a mountain ash borer beetle, then then we really are gonna have a, a fun ride here. Um, yeah, I'm a little concerned about it. Um, when I saw it, it actually landed on my car. Oh. In, in, and it was there for like half a second because I didn't have time to grab my phone and take a picture. Um, <laughs> yeah, you never do, right? No. <laughs> so yeah. anyway. Yeah. It's always those serendipitous moments when you actually have the right equipment at the right moment. Um, same for aspen trees. Yeah. Yeah, aspen trees are looking bad. We kind of glanced at aspen trees um, when we did our tree walk this morning and they're they're struggling and, and my my pat answer is is give them water you know help them out they're struggling this has been a very dry windy spring and we're we're under our normal amount of moisture so so everything is struggling we're trying we're starting to ease into a drought which is never what anyone wants to hear so our trees need more more water and, and that's, a, that's a tough one, especially if you're going into a drought, you know, that's where you want to conserve water. But if your ash trees are, you've got an ash tree worth saving, then by all means, water it, keep it going. And, and I've got a list of the chemicals needed for spraying a tree or, or treating the tree. And, and so make sure it's a tree that's worth the money to save it because the, the right chemical actually lasts for three years but the other chemicals are only good for one year. And so you have to keep, keep spraying it and keep treating it and treating it. And, and so that's several hundred dollars per tree per year. So make sure it's a tree you want to save and it's, it's worth it to your landscape and your pocketbook. Okay. Um, yeah, the honey locusts, I'm watching them struggle. Um, looked at a bunch of them up in um, the point. Yeah, point's difficult. Difficult soil in the point. Everything struggles in the point, tree-wise. Um, honey locust, and I've, I've actually seen a little bit of honey locust um, plant bug damage on some of the trees, and I'm also seeing a lot more galls, and I'm starting to see chlorosis really early in the season to see chlorosis, but I looked at some cottonwood trees and some aspens that had chlorosis already, so it's so, so look closely at your trees and look closely at those leaves and see how they look. You know, is it the normal green or is it a green where the veins are sticking out and the rest of the leaf is a light color? You know, that's, I like iron sulfate over a lot of the others. Um, ironite doesn't work in our soils. Um, the chelated irons, I think, are really expensive and I'm not convinced that, they're, that they work. So I do like iron sulfate. It's a lot less expensive. It's easy to apply and it works fairly quickly. The, the caveat with all these iron products is too much of a good thing is going to um, burn the leaves. It, it, too much iron goes up through the tree and it, it'll burn the leaves. So you gotta be really careful with that. And I always recommend half rates to start off with. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm going to share my screen here and get things going here. And, and, and. Okay, so 
this is um, this, this is what I've been seeing up to this point. And so this is, I've been getting a lot of emails and then I'm on this program called Microsoft Teams, which is, which is a very interesting program. Um, trying to deal with that and so I get a lot of a lot of things coming in as um, voicemails <laughs> so Google voice takes takes it and interprets what someone is saying and then I get I get it sent to me through Microsoft Teams so it it's a couple translations um, but here's this, this is just such a common gardening myth is hi I have coniferous trees in my yard and the lawn is struggling can you recommend a lime product to help adjust the pH? Really? So the whole thing about pine needles making the soil underneath a pine tree acidic is, is myth. Never been proven that it does. And it just, it would take hundreds of years for that to happen. And so this, this is just all myth. So the lawn isn't getting enough sunlight to grow because the, the pine tree is shading it, right? I mean, it's just too shady and it's also so much competition for water. I mean, the pine tree is winning on this one. And so between the shade and the water, yeah, the lawn's not going to do well underneath a pine tree. And so my advice is, you know, I told them about, you know, don't add lime, you know, it's, you know you're essentially going to create bricks. Um, uh, <laughs> It can cause more problems for the tree than it's worth. And it says, don't worry about the grass. The tree is far more valuable. And he responds back, I'll get the soil tested for the pH. <laughs> so I, I think he really wanted to, to treat that soil and, and get the pH up higher so the grass would grow. I think the grass was more important to him than, uh, than the pine tree. Okay, so a guy moving from Georgia to Laramie County, and so the soil pH in Georgia is 5.5, almost 50 inches of moisture a year. <laughs> and <clears throat> so his question is, do, do black flies, now for, for all of those of you who've grown up back east, black flies are nasty and they will chase you into the house or or into the water or wherever trying to escape them and they bite they're nasty little flies and so he's asking about black flies up here in laramie area if so um, are they a big nuisance and if not why do you think that well i think they all get blown back east is what i think happens to them it's just too dry for them here thank heavens we don't have them we got enough other pest problems as for gardening, giving the mineral, minimum monthly rainfall, is it fair to say that all gardeners need to water frequently? So I thought you guys might need some humor tonight. So this is, I tried to find some of the, the, the funner, funniest stuff that I've been dealing with. So the next section is titled Aliens. I have never seen such a thing. I have done some online searching and came up blank. So you can see the shadows tell you the best. Can you see the little fingers coming out? <laughs> so this is this is called caused by a midge, and so this is just finger gall. And you know, it was on a couple leaves. I told him just to pull the leaves off, throw them away. Don't don't worry about it. Okay, Kathy Shreve, this is one for you. Fall bulbs are still waiting. This person bought some tulip bulbs last fall on sale at Lowe's. And then while cleaning the garage this May, she noticed that they had little worms. I'd say throw them away. <laughs> okay, what is this and how do I get rid of it? Y'all should know what this guy is. This is a pretty common weedy pest tree. I mean, call, call a tree a pest or a weed in Cheyenne. But this is a box elder. And most likely a seed blew in, found the great spot, and sprouted. This is my favorite one. This is my favorite. I need some assistance. My mother-in-law keeps finding these in her yard. She's found one in the yard, one in a bird bath, and one in a planter. She has no idea where they are coming from and says they are all hard like coral. 
Well, my first comment was, looks like bread. And she goes, no, they're hard like coral. I said, would you sniff it? And I was like, <laughs> why would I do that? And I was like, well, it looks like bread. It looks like a cinnamon roll. She goes, oh, no, no, they're hard like coral. I said, okay. It, it could be a mold. I said, you know, molds do weird things. So I sent the picture to Steve Miller at UW. And he's like, nope, not a clue. My best guess would be a very dried cinnamon roll been partly eaten by birds. And, and, that's, and that's the answer I said to her. And so it was actually better coming from Steve Miller at UW than me. <laughs> it had a little more weight, I guess. All right, my, my tree has strange bumps. Well, look at, okay, strange bumps. Just now noticing these. This has been here for a quite a long time. And not only has it, has it sapped and sealed over, but it's, it's hard. And same thing in the other pictures. And the only clue, she didn't know what kind of tree it was. So the only clue I have is right back here. Can you guys see this? So it's, it, it looks real soft and supple and the needles are really sparse on it. So I emailed her back, back and said, is this a pinion pine? And she goes, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so. So some of this actually looks more like hail damage. It, it could be squirrel damage, but to me, this is hail damage. And, and the tree is just sapped over the wound. It, it could be cytosporous canker, but it, it, it's nothing that she can really do anything about. It's way too late. Okay, lawns. <laughs> lawns aren't my strong point, so. <laughs> I kind of struggle with these, but um, some of them are pretty easy. This question came in, it says, would you look at the turf in the front yard? It was power raked last week and I believe they might've ruined, ruined it. It's down to dirt and spots. I don't have to look at that, <laughs> it's, it's, that's easy. I, I don't ever recommend power raking. It is like taking a disc to your lawn and disking your lawn. And it, if you want to dry the lawn out and kill it, power rake it because it just it just breaks up those rhizomes off the bluegrass and it goes down too deep into so the soil moisture now your now the soil is exposed to the sun and so it dries out so not a lot you can do and and then i have a brown spot i get a lot of these you know i have a brown spot in my lawn okay um, not in a shaded area, but by our sidewalk. It's like, well, did you use um, any de-icing material? Did you shovel the snow in that spot? Oh yeah, shovel the snow in that spot. Yeah, I used de-icing material. Okay, so another lawn question. What do you recommend to stop grass from growing in my garden? Roundup. Okay, <laughs> this is title this, Kay can eat it too. So I sent a master gardener out to look at this because it was in her neighborhood up by, um, not quite the Table Mountain area, but up, up that way. Um, what it would take to reseed a prairie, um, what kind of seed is needed, how to do it, when to do it. Um, she went up and looked at it and came back and said, it's all buffalo grass and he's got horses on there and he didn't want to pull the horses off. So you, you can't reseed and especially now, I mean, that's just, you're just wasting your time and money. But you gotta pull the horses off. You can't reseed and have those little tiny, tasty grass seedlings come up because the horses are just gonna pull that out, rip and all, and eat it, and thank you for the candy. So that's always a tough one because people don't wanna pull their horses off pasture. They, they think that that's cruel. Um, the bottom line is that the land is worth more than our horses will ever be. And I, I don't know anyone in this area that's got $100,000 horses. Okay, question number two. Would like to know if he should spray for weeds or lay grass seed first. Um, trying to reseed two acres of prairie. 
advice to spray in the paw, fall for the perennial weeds and not to worry about the dandelions because he was concerned about the dandelions and how his neighbors might think about them. And it's like, don't worry about what your neighbors think. It's your land. Get that one a lot. Oh, this is great. Has hornets nesting in the upper eaves of her house. Wanted to know what she could do about them. She's 85 and can't climb a ladder to spray them with raid. <laughs> Call pest control. Okay. All right. So, um, so Kathy Shreve, so put on your EPA, your uh, Department of DEQ hat on this one. I was planning on trying to do a raised bed. I had soil delivered. It's very stinky. It's not like an earthy compost smell. It smells more like sewage. It's scary. So we had kind of this long conversation. It turns out he had soil delivered. He got a hold of a friend who knew a friend sort of thing. He had soil delivered. And when he talked about the guy, talked to the guy about where it came from, it was a swampy area. And he wasn't sure if it was safe for him or his family if he grew vegetables in there. No, no. Okay, I, I get, okay, the, this one's titled The Bribe. I get this, I get this one a lot, a couple times a summer and pretty consistently. Um, I'm a senior citizen and I'm looking for someone that can help me with my flower beds. Just cleaning out the old stuff, basically. Would you give me a call and let me know if you have some names of people? So she wanted me to give her names to call that might be interested in doing that. And then, and then she ended with, I'm willing to pay. <laughs> well, master gardeners, we don't do this stuff. We're, we're not for hire. We don't clean up other people's flower beds for free. <laughs> so, no. And it always makes me feel bad too, because you know I'm a senior citizen and I'm trying to stay in my house, and you know my flower bed's getting weedy, and my neighbors, you know, aren't thinking very highly of it. And it's like, you know, don't worry about what your neighbors think; have them come help you. But I, I always love this. I'm willing to pay. Dead or alive? I have a tree, and he thinks it's dying. He would like to get a second opinion. <laughs> Next question, I'm calling about some trees that we have. They're little spruce trees, they're dying, but not really sure what kind, I'm sure why they turned kind of gray and now the grass around them is dying. And we're really concerned that maybe some chemicals got poured on them or it's a disease that might spread to other trees. And I, I apologize, because I, I should have gotten some pictures of this. And this is, this is classic. And I'm seeing a lot of this year. It's, like, it's not like our trees have enough problems but these weren't planted right. And whoever planted them, left them in their little balls or their pots and planted the whole thing. And so the roots never got to grow out and then they're grossly underwatered. And, and the growth on them was literally like a half an inch. And then the, the lawn, lawn around them's dying because they're not getting any water, <laughs> no water. And hard as rock, oh my gosh, I mean, like concrete, it was awful. Okay, so I titled this one, What Do You Like to Eat? I'm starting a raised garden for the first time, so we're, I'm getting a lot of this too, you know, people who are starting a first vegetable garden ever, and I'd like some help learning what vegetables would do best. What do you like to eat? <laughs> what will you eat? What will you eat? What do you like to eat? Don't, don't ask me. <laughs> okay. And this, this has been an interesting one because this person's been getting all her, her, doing all this research online to get her advice. And, and just now getting, sent me this question via Ask an Expert, which is a, an extension wide, national extension wide, um, ask, ask us a question. Just try to stump the horticulturist type questions. Um, so my fa house faces west with, with nothing but endless prairie. So I'm kind of thinking she's not happy where she lives. And you guys all appreciate this one. Um, I've planted emerald green arborvitae in a 50-foot row and lost both sets to winter winds 
that hit them. Okay, I've planted in May and the next May they're dead. Been following watering to a T. Well, okay, the little label may tell you something or the internet may tell you something, but is it, is it the right information for Cheyenne, Wyoming? Probably not. Those probably needed to be watered every day. Um, I'm now wanting to try Wichita blue junipers. No. I need something extremely hardy to handle Cheyenne winter and winds. So I'm going to stop sharing here and, oops, maybe I'll stop sharing here. Okay. And I'm going to pull up my email because this has been gone. This has been gone on, going on for quite a few emails. So she was looking at Wichita blue junipers and, and then she advised that she had the conservation district come out and plant a windbreak, but the antelope had trampled it down to nothing, which I'm, I'm, I'm kind of surprised. You know, I, I know that they can be a little destructive, but you know, if she'd been putting water on it, um, she should have had something of a windbreak. So we're looking to purchase six to eight foot trees for replacements in about a 50 foot row between the house and the barn to help stop the wind in that area. And then she also wants it for privacy. And I advised her that, you know, she should be looking at Eastern red cedars because that they're going to take the wind and, and deal with it. But she wants the six to eight foot tall trees. And so what she found was um, idle wide, idle wild upright junipers. And I'm like, and I, I email her back and it's like, um, no, they're not gonna work either. So she finally, she finally emailed me her, and I'm trying to find that, um, if that's here. Sorry about scrolling. Uh, da, 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 da. She finally emailed me her location and she's out on Terry Ranch Road. So if you, so she's on the very south end of Cheyenne. And she's about as far south as you can get without being in Colorado. And so the picture was, um, so imagine, you know, the, there's a, a house on the north side and then a barn on the south side, and there's a 50 foot gap between the two of them. So once I got to see that, I was able to explain to her that you know, there's this venturi effect going on and that the only thing that's going to work in there is to put up a wood wind fence, a, to put up just a regular privacy fence to stop the wind and then to plant on one, on, on the, the east side, the side away from the wind to get stuff going. And her response was, well, thank you very much. Heavy sigh. That explains why we've literally lost thousands of dollars in trees. And then she's hoping that someone builds a house across the road from her to help reduce the wind blast. But the bottom line with that is it's, it's not, it's just not going to change that, that Venturi effect. So once you get a house here and a house here and the wind's going to go through there, you know, I told her if it's 15 miles out here, it's 30 miles here because that Venturi squeezes it down. So I, I don't think she wants to put in a wind fence, <laughs> but trees aren't going to survive that. Okay, so so here's what I'm seeing a lot of this year. And, and if you look at this, this is a spruce tree. This is over by the airport. This is on the south side of the Cheyenne Airport, and this is a little alley back in here. So I get to go in some very interesting places on my yard calls, and this was kind of secondary to the yard call I was doing actually but I couldn't help help myself take pictures so spruce trees you know remember they are a riparian tree and they like cool moist soil and so they're almost as bad as aspens and cottonwoods and what they like so they need a lot more water and if you notice this here is on a slope and and so trying to water this is going to be exceptionally difficult. The water is just going to run right off. And then if you notice over here, 
Can you guys see these little orange tufts? That's the bailing twine. They still- Catherine, Catherine, you need to share your screen again. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm rattling away and you guys can't see what I'm talking about. Better? Okay, can you guys? All right, all right, cool. I'll make this larger. All right. So again, um, so, a slope, and it's a south-facing slope. It's your, it's your worst case scenario, right? South-facing slope. And, and so it just gets beat up with the sun. You can see that it's brown. There's no soil here or no grass here. The grass here is, is, is not getting enough water. And so these, these spruce trees that, that need a lot of water aren't getting enough water. And then if you can tell, you know, I'm not the greatest photographer, but you can see that it's dead up on the top. That's really the freeze, that, that freeze we had in April. That did that, that did, that's what did that to it. And so right here, the freeze, that's all freeze damage. And then if you look over here, to, so to compound the tree's problem, you know, it's not getting enough water, it's on a slope, it's got hit by the freeze, and then to make its life even more miserable, can you guys see these little tufts here? That's the bailing twine. It's, it still has, it's still in its ball. And it's never, it can't, ex, it can't get the roots out. <laughs> and, and so it's just, it needs to be removed. Oh, this whole row of trees in here were so badly planted that it, it, they just need to be pulled out, properly planted and with the right kind of tree. And it's not a spruce and it's not cottonwoods. That, I don't know how they, the developer got away with that one but uh, bad news bad news all around okay beautiful yard oh my gosh this yard is just amazing big lot a really big lot and beautiful beautifully landscaped but his is like well what's what's wrong with my tree and it's like well there's a bunch of things going on with this tree one this is all just on one side and it's actually the east side the the northeast side so I suspect freeze damage, but the other clue is right here. This is all brand new sidewalk. And, and so I think this also com contributed to some of the damage for this tree. And when you rip out that sidewalk, you gotta dig down farther and recompact the soil and reamend the soil to hold concrete. And so I think this contributed to it but this is, this is all, again, freeze damage. And it's like, well, the other ponderosas are doing fine, but this one isn't. And it's just it's like, uh, I, I, I think there's a couple things going on here. So this is one, again, I was in the back alley and I took this picture, but it's, it's all right in through here. This whole section of this tree is just really, it's, all those needles are dead, and I don't, I don't know if that's um, the frost, but the top is doing fine. So this is going to be a really ugly tree for a while. And unfortunately, a lot of the arborists are running around and telling people that it's this, this red-banded needle fungus. No, it's not. Nah. Unless they've got an ELSA test done. Yeah. So this is um, this is kind of sad. I, I've been watching this tree for oh, almost 15 years now. This is a European mountain ash, and and this tree was was truly the the pride of the neighborhood. And this is probably one of the the better looking ash mountain ash trees I've seen. Big, mature, just healthy. Well, the guy stopped watering his part of his lawn and then you can see all the damage on the trunk this is all weed whacker damage and and then something happened here not really sure this was um 
it was over in John and Susie Heller's neighborhood. And so they just hauled me over to, to the, across the street to look at the tree and the neighbor wasn't home, so we couldn't ask him questions. But this is, this is a good 50% of the bark is gone on the trunk. And then on the other side of the trunk, you can see here, there's more bark missing. And then over here, there's a root that's starting to be girdled. But I think what really is taking this tree out is the fact that it's lost so much bark area, so much of the cambium. And then it's, and if you look at the lawn, and, and lawns are a big clue. You need to look at lawns when you do a tree call, because the, the lawn is going to tell you a lot about how they're watering the tree. If the lawn is hard as a rock and not green, they're, they're not watering. They're not watering enough. You know, if you look at the trunk of this tree and you go by the, for every inch of trunk diameter, 10 gallons, this is 20 inches. So this tree needs 200 gallons of water to be happy. And, and so how often does it need the water? Well, at least, at least once a week to once every 10 days. So at least twice a month, you gotta pour 200 gallons of water on this tree to help it be happy. And so between the loss of, loss of bark, loss of water, and Lord knows what else, um, it, it's just a dead tree. I'm sure the, the frost in April finished it off. So very, very disappointing, very sad to see that. A beautiful tree, just beautiful. Okay, frost damage, this is freeze, freeze damage. And so this was also an interesting yard call this is all a slope, this slopes down. And so this picture doesn't relay it real well. But the, the guy had said, well, and I asked him how much he's watering it. And he says, well, I stopped watering it. I, someone told me that I don't need to water. I got advice that said I don't need to water this anymore. <laughs> really? <laughs> Mature trees need to be watered. I can't, you can't neglect them. He says, no, no, I was told that it's a mature tree and it's got deep roots and, and it's can take care of itself. No. Turns out he had gotten his advice from the sprinkler repair guy. There's authority on trees. The sprinkler repair guy. Okay, freeze damage. That's right down here. Um yeah, dead bark. I'm sure it's freeze or you know a combination of freeze or sunburn and then trees for sale at big box stores this is this is always a source of entertainment for me um so the tags the tags are getting worse I, they're they're setting everybody up for failure i hate this maturity varies space varies so you don't even know where to plant this how big is it going to get varies hardiness varies really Water, two to three times a week until established. Okay. Um, but, but this whole varies. How, how can you find a place to plant it? Or how, how much space does it need? <laughs> varies. Okay. A blue atlas cedar, Cedrus atlantica. This should be a real big giveaway. Atlantica. That, that tells me right there that it's gonna want a moist acidic soil. But here's, okay everybody, your quiz. Is this going to survive a Wyoming winter? Is this tree an annual or a perennial in Cheyenne? Okay, so that's, <laughs> that's my story. That's what I have for tonight. And uh, Marie, I'll turn it back over to you and I will stop making everybody crazy. Catherine. This is Sherry. Yep. Were you going to uh, uh, mention the pruning at Davis? Yes. Um, <laughs> So 
I was out at Davis Hospice on Tuesday, and we were trying to fight back weeds. They got a horrible um, thistle problem and grass. And, and then I just, we were talking and we were on the sidewalk and one of their patients was wheeled by in a wheelchair and he literally had to stand up in his wheelchair to look over the shrubbery to see this beautiful landscaping down in their hollow. And it's beautiful but he couldn't see it over the shrubs. So what I would like to do is get together a group, and if possible, my schedule out, if possible, um, next, next Tuesday, the 23rd, and get a group of people together. We'll do it, a, we'll treat it as a, a group yard call. And so um, bring your pruning shears, bring your loppers. Um, we'll talk a lot about some of the trees out there that they're either weren't planted right or the wrong species. Some of the problems I saw out there, we'll talk about pruning. And so this will be a good lesson on pruning. And, and I know it's at, during the day and a lot of you guys are still working, but um, Sherry, what time would be good for you guys? Is like like nine o'clock good? Would that work? Yeah. Yes, nine o'clock. Okay, so, so if we could all, the more the merrier and and so it'll be a pruning lesson, it'll be a yard call. And, and Steve, especially if you can join us, that time counts. Of course, for all of you guys, the time counts, but it would it'd be a great lesson. Um, pruning, and how to prune a shrub, and shrubs that are too tall for people in wheelchairs to see over and how to bring them down in height and how to prune so it doesn't look like you were even there. And they've got a lot of stuff that's trying to eat the sidewalk and kind of a mess. And there's a group of very faithful, loyal, dedicated master gardeners trying to trying to keep the jungle down there. And a great experience. But if you can make it next Tuesday, um, That would be excellent. And Sherry, thanks for reminding me. And I will send an email out too. And I'll get, I'll actually get that an email started. So I remember. If people don't know where Davis Hospice is, it's at uh, Story and um, Sycamore, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, it's you can't miss it. It's just right off of um, right off of story and beautiful facility. The gardens are gorgeous. Davis was actually on on a garden walk a number of years ago, and where a whole group of master gardeners descended on it. We cleaned it up. We identified stuff, and and I actually I think there's a jasmine plant on there in that in the back in the back very protected courtyard. So it it's really a very cool place from a gardening standpoint, to quantify that. Right, right. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, ta -da -ta -da. Yeah, and um, Kathy had a comment about the trees look like they were planted too deeply. You didn't see a trunk flare. And it's that at Davis, we'll look at some trees that were planted too deep and they don't have that trunk flare. flare. And so we'll talk about that and, and what to look for. But essentially, if a tree still looks like a power pole in the ground, it was planted too deeply and most likely um, it's still got the ball all wrapped around it. Um, uh, okay. Okay. Um, Okay. <laughs> yeah, and for the lady who um, had the bulbs that she overwintered in her garage, I, I suspect that they were mostly just dead. And, you know, if they had worms coming on them, mm, those, I would be throwing those in the trash. Okay. Um, so anyway, that's, that's the fun I've been having. And uh, I, I've, I've taken over almost 200 calls since I've been working out of the house. And I've, I've probably done 25 to 30 yard calls already. So it's been, it's been a really busy spring. I think, I think people are actually, you know, they're home and they are, they're finally looking at their yard and they're finally going, oh, 
I, I see stuff. You know, it's like the lady that saw the, the bumps on her pinions. Those are old. That's old damage. So it, it's been interesting. But anyway, that's my story. And Marie, I'm going to turn everything back over to you and stop babbling. Hi, this is Barb. Um, I can share a screen for the uh, show and tell if I'm, I'm allowed to do that. Um, yeah, Barb, I, I did set you up so that you can share. So okay. you should be able to. Yep. All right. Uh, we will start. So I hope that people who um, contributed photos are around and we'll get started here um let's see what do i have to click here okay Roz, are you out there unmute yourself and tell us about your plants there you are yeah. good um I, I guess i first can you hear me okay i guess you're good <laughs> okay good um, you know, um, I, uh, so let me just tell you a little bit about, uh, uh, where I, where I live. Um, my house was built in 1939, uh, by George Hobbs, you know, Hobbs school and that kind of thing. And, um, it's one of three cornerstone houses that were built, uh, one of them is where the elk statue is at the corner of Dell Range and Yellowstone. Mine is one block north, and then there's one two blocks down from me. And we that was that was the, uh, the three cornerstone houses for what later became Yellowstone Edition. So I'm right across the street from the golf course on Yellowstone. And George lived there for 25 years. And then the house was bought by Marion and Fran Lewis. Uh, they, they owned the Coca-Cola and Coors Distributing. And they lived there for 25 years. Um, I believe that they were the ones that uh, brought the city water to the house. So I still have a well and um, use that for irrigation. But they were more, I would call them more, uh, they had a landscape yard, but they didn't have any interest in it. So when I moved in 40 years ago, which is hard to believe, um, I, uh, I was astonished at how well I, I like to say the house the yard had good bones okay and so when one thing stopped one tree stopped blooming another one started you know that kind of thing but i can't say they really had a garden and i don't know about you but to me a garden the difference between a yard and a garden is i think a garden is the stories that we can tell. So I'm going to title my little presentation Memory and Mystery because that's kind of what this is all about. And, and if you're like me, as you're working in the garden, sometimes you, you go, I have no idea where that came from. That's a mystery. Or it brings back wonderful memories. So this first one is simply, it's the only one, Barb, that I can actually tell you what I, I know what it is. Okay. Um, it's actually, uh, you know, a bloody uh, Cranesville, the, uh, the hardy geranium. And um, one, whenever I look at this, and it's right in bloom now, I, I realize that I planted it 27 years ago because I was coming back from London and my husband and I stopped at one of, it's one of those garden centers like in Eaton, Colorado or something. 
and we bought this and I planted it. So every time I, um, I look at this plant, I think of the christening of my nephew. Uh, so. All right. All right. Um, you know how gardeners just love to share their stuff, but then sometimes, as in what happened with my neighbor across the street, she had a spot that just had become too shady, and she said, can you take this iris? And I said, oh, sure. You know how you never turn anything down. I planted it years and years and years ago never bloomed, and then, wouldn't you know, about a couple of days ago, it bloomed. I raced across the street, and I said, our iris, it bloomed, it bloomed. <laughs> so I know nothing more about it, but I think of her, and now she can share it as well. Uh, I like to call this my uh, heritage peony because I don't have any idea uh, about the history of this. But let me just tell you that it was planted in the back patio, whether it was planted by, by the Lewises or by the, the Hobbs before, the, before them, I don't know. But over time, it just wasn't getting enough sun. So, so to start with, the mother plant, if you will, is more than 40 years old, okay? So I said, okay, hell, just, I'm going to take some of this and plant it someplace just to fill a space. And guess what? I picked apparently the right place and it just loves it there. But the kicker to this story is that I was mowing today and a, a little social distancing from this plant, it's about six feet away from, from here, is another cutting that I took of the same plant. And that one is the prettiest pink one you've ever seen. So I'm just gonna call this a mystery. <laughs> okay, so I think that's your last one. Um, oh, no, you had some more. That's, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people say, um, they talk about um, planting roses. Well, this is another one of these massive, um, I think this is the red leaf uh, rose, you know, the rugosa. And gosh darn, you can, why not go with something that's so darn hardy? This thing, I... It has the prettiest rose hips, and if you can see right in the middle of the picture, you can see some from last, last year. Um, interestingly, in the last, I'd say, 10 or 15 years, I have had more of these sprouting up all over the, the yard. But explain to me why 30 years before I didn't. So another mystery. Okay. Oh, here's another mystery. Um, I had a, a columbine like this um, in a way in another part of the yard. And, and I, I thought it was odd that after, and, I, and the weird thing was I never planted that original uh, columbine. And then it could come back this year. And I'm mowing again after you, Barb, you sent your, you know, your, uh, your little thing, your little email. And I went, well, my goodness, where did this thing come from? And, and so I think nature decided, well, the old one is dying. We got a new one coming in. Okay. And then I think I have one more. Yeah, okay. So um, I know that you, uh, I know you all have all had something like this happen. 
my late husband's uh, sister lived in Carpenter, Wyoming. And so she calls us and I have decided that this was probably in the, probably the mid 1990s. So she calls us and she says, y'all just have to come out here right now. I've got too many yellow columbines and you've just got to dig, dig some up. And you have to understand that this sister is the one that when Bob would pick the uh, choke cherries, that he would send them down to her and they would come back miraculously in little jars as jelly. <laughs> so you have to make sure that when Elsie says, come get these things, you go down there and get them. Well, I have to tell you, these yellow columbines have taken over my yard. And of course, every time I think of her uh, or think I see them, I think of her and that's that memory. But the other day I was uh, taking care of my uh, neighbor's yard while they were out of town and I kind of did a walk around making sure everything was okay and wouldn't you know, there's a couple of yellow columbines <laughs> over there. It's the gift that just keeps on giving. So that's my mystery memory tour. <laughs> Thanks, Roz. Yeah, yeah. Th those yellow columbine are very hardy. <laughs> okay, up next, we have Susan Carlson and her iris. Susan, are you there? You can, you can um, put yourself on video or unmute yourself, whichever. Um, I don't see Susan. Okay. So she has, um, in her email, she mentioned that these are iris that she has no idea what the names are. I think they were gift type iris as well, or maybe she lost the tags, but th that one's a really interesting one, pale lavender and gold. Um, that's a nice one. It looks... She's got a great yard if you've ever been there. And uh, this one's really interesting with the big white um, tongue. <laughs> is that the tongue? I don't know. I forgot my iris parts. I can't remember. And oh, Lila, you're up next. I saw you up here before, Lila, so come on up. There she is. There you are. Okay. I'm here. <laughs> Great. Good to see you. Um, I loved uh, Roz's talk on her yard. I didn't realize that's where she lived, but I thought I know a lot of those plants that she has. And I thought, what, what fun to, to explore a yard that you've had for that many years, and yet you still find mystery in it. <laughs> but um, this little plant is a tufted primrose, and we were over at our cabin um, at Lake Hattie the other day. Actually, it was over Memorial Day weekend. And I was walking around the front of the house and lo and behold, here was this little primrose blooming and it was so pretty. And I thought, well, I have to have a picture of that because they don't bloom for very long and usually we're not over there so I don't get to see them. So I had to include this. This isn't actually in our yard here in Cheyenne. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. All right. This was just a picture of, uh, actually I was, I was trying to get the picture of the uh, pine leaf pinstamen in the background against the garage that they grow where they want to grow. And when columbines and things like that move, that's kind of what some of these native plants do as well. You know, in the forefront, there's a, a Jupiter's beard and there's um, a Rocky Mountain pinstamen that's just starting to bloom. And there's some other stuff in there. The iris are about done, but the, uh, that pine leaf pinstamen has been against the garage for probably, I don't know, 15 years now, I suppose. Uh, it likes it, it there, so. <laughs> I think a, it, a native type thing, it grows in rocks, so I yes, guess it likes yes, concrete yes, yes, too, yes. so very good. And I think I counted three bees in yes, this picture. Yes. Did I get them all? I, I took this picture because I went out to take this 
some of these pictures for this and I thought there are bees all over the all over this canadia and this this is a plant that I got from uh, Michelle Bohannon and she told me she says it'll spread well she wasn't kidding it does spread but anyway yes the bees and they were great big bumblebees and when they landed the the tops of the of the plants the blooms would like fall over it's like oh the bees too big for the bloom but it was really cool <laughs> yeah that's neat uh, oh those are pretty yes those are some iris that um the the light colored the purple ones on the left are a uh, from my husband's grandmother's yard in uh, missouri i have two big mm -hmm. groupings of those and they're very very prolific and so i'm gonna have to like thin them out at some point in time. The apricot ones are some that are just, um, I've had them for many years and I've moved them around and I finally got them to where I can get more than two or three blooms off of them. Very good. And then Very my good. front that has planted itself there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, won't complain. And? This is some tick seed that I found out in the prairie the other day and don't pay any attention to the cheatgrass that's in the background there, but, um, <laughs> we haven't some years we have coreopsis and some years we don't and i just happened to spot some the other day when i was out looking for something else and there it was so i took a picture of it yeah. mm -hmm. and this was another one that's a gillardia that came up in the prairie you know it's it's another native they just grow on their own i have some in my flower bed but they're much more interesting to see them in the prairie where they're supposed to be And this was another one. That's a salvia that's growing in the prairie. I have some in a flower oh, bed. Yeah. This is throughout in the prairie. You know, it's a hundred yards away. So hmm. usually it's about two feet tall, but this year it's because it's been a little drier and the conditions are a little different. It hasn't gotten that tall. It's about maybe 10 inches tall this year. So hmm. okay, so interesting. And that's the picture of my <laughs> my columbines and some of the other stuff, the Cranes Bill and the Johnson's Blue and the peonies that haven't, they just started blooming today. They weren't blooming in this picture. Um, and I've also got some Asiatic iris or Asiatic lilies in there and they haven't started blooming yet either. But this is just kind of a down the side of the patio and that's a little bit more of a close-up i've got a poor little heuchera coral bell that's been dwarfed by everything and i'm i'm afraid to move it because i'll probably kill it if i do so <laughs> it's one of those things you know <laughs> or you do like Roz when when something has more than one shoot you can finally take part of it and move it yeah. and leave the the original part yeah okay and oh i guess we're around time. so thank you lila thanks um this is a picture of our front yard and down in front you see all that nice soil there that was all of mark's hard work um so the garden over to the right is what i planted 30 years ago and most of the stuff in there has been hanging around for 30 years including um perennial bachelor buttons, also known as cornflower. And we'll take a close up look here. This is on the other side of the little shrub. The people walking by on the sidewalk don't get to see this. This is filigree daisy and themis marshalliana, I guess. I don't know. If you think it's something else, let me know. Um, then a few years ago, we had an egress window put in and, you know, I didn't go and scrape off the topsoil or anything. So when they got all done, it was just clay and it's still clay. And I keep throwing plants in there. Over on the right, you can see that periwinkle is doing really well. Um, there's uh, sweet woodruff, uh, columbines, and dead nettle, and um, the, um, uh, behind me, there's, um, Rocky Mountain Punstamon working its way over there too, but it's very shady. This is the north corner of our house. 
And the poppies were great this year. Um, this is a new raised bed um, on the outside of our patio. A couple of years ago, we had a friend enclose part of our patio so that we could eat out there without getting attacked by yellow jackets and also to give a place uh, for the cats to go out and play in, in the daytime. Um, we don't let them loose, so if they're going to go outside, they have to go in their catio. Um, so a friend of us, ours, that built the catio, also built this raised bed with the trellises. And the idea is we needed a wind fence, um, some kind of wind break, because uh, what we found out once we enclosed the catio is that the wind comes around the corner, and then this winter it dropped a three or four foot deep drift on top of my raised bed farther down. And I said, you know, we can't have that. <laughs> this is the inside of the catio. That's Lewis and Lark in their new cat tree made by the same friend. Um, they, they're really into it. Right now they're looking the other way, but normally they're looking off to the right because that's where the bird feeder is. And um, they've just made us uh, this shelf thing. Um, if you need any um, carpentry done like this, let me know. I'll give you Dave's uh, contact information. He's very meticulous and very tidy and, and we love having to work with him or getting to work with him. I've been trying growing um, amaryllis from seed and so I bring them outside in the summer and let them get more sunlight than they can in my windows. And I don't let them go dormant, so I have amaryllis blooming from January through April. Depends. Every year is a little different. This is the view from the catio looking out the other side of the back door. And, and this bed down in front is the one that got three feet of snow sitting on it from like November until, I don't know, it was like three months. I'm surprised anything came back up. Um, a lot of it is, uh, I don't know, mint. So if you put five kinds of mint in the same raised bed, they duke it out. And if you're lucky, they all kind of stay in their own corner. And then over on, in the back there, that garden um, is all uh, like echinacea and rudbeckia by late, late summer. And that's an ash tree in the back. I mean, we really hate to lose that. This is over at the Board of Public Utilities. Um, their little purple asters are doing great this year. If you happen to drive by, they've got butterflies showing up. It's really good. And then over at the Botanic Gardens, the Habitat Hero Garden there, we have yellow columbine. They don't look like they're the same color and they're kind of tall um, as Roz's. Um, and, but you know, Barb, Barb um, you know how close I am to the Botanic Gardens. It's very possible. <laughs> It, it could be mine. Well, actually, I know where these came from. They came from a packet of seed that I started three years ago, or two years ago. And uh, it was supposed to be different colors of columbine. And now this is the third season, and they're all starting to look the same. So I think what happens is they, they do their own genetic thing. So by the time we get done, I think they're going to all be yellow. So. Um, and this one, I don't remember planting this particular um, penstemon. Maybe we got some from Kathy Shreve or Michelle Bohannon, but this is um, a palmeri or palmer's penstemon. And if you look down in the lower left corner, the lowest flower, you can see a, f a leaf right above that flower, and it's they've got sharp edges, they're serrated edges, which is kind of interesting. And they move around this garden. Um, they'll die out in one place and you're going, oh no, look at that terrible brown spot. And then you look 10 feet away and, and there it is, you know. So this is a really big patch. You should get down there and enjoy it now because who knows where it'll be next year. And this was another penstemon that we planted and the tick seed has just gotten going. Um, it's moved around. Last year it was all along the sidewalk, um, but I noticed a lot of that isn't coming back, but it's coming up in new places. So it's a very dynamic garden. Um, we're pulling the weeds 
We're throwing in new plants. Um, not all of the area gets watered the same, just because some of the plants block the others. <laughs> and um, so you just, you never know what's going to happen. It's, it's kind of interesting. And so far the Botanic Gardens people haven't said, you don't know how to garden. They're, they're kind of grateful that we actually get flowers blooming when they're still struggling to get all of theirs, um, their annuals planted. Um, the rock garden, the crevice garden, if you haven't been down to see that recently, you need to get down there. It's, it's pretty spectacular this year. And then let's see, Bonnie Harper. I have not seen her on here. She sent, she's my co-chair. Where is she? Um, but she has a fantastic um, display of iris this year, and I need to get out there to see it. There's one. Now, this is an out-of-focus iris, and I was thinking about calling her back and saying, hey, you want to retake that one. But what you need to do is look behind that iris and see part of her garden going on up to her front door. It's, it's pretty neat. Um, and this is, I don't know, a really high contrast picture. And it's pretty neat. Uh, and that one, I don't know. That one looks like one that we had a photo from Susan, I think. Um, and then she has columbine. These are probably Rocky Mountain columbine because they're the blue and white, I'm thinking. And a, a yellow one, maybe. But this is the one she has a question on. Does anybody know? What kind of columbine that is um, that doesn't have the traditional North American columbine look to it. Does anybody know what kind that is? Uh, Barb, it looks kind of like some of the European columbines, I think, but I'm not sure. Yeah, um, I have a European columbine, but it, it's about the size of my thumb. It's just a short little pink thing and it doesn't have any spurs and this has really long petals so I don't know yeah I don't either and then I think the end I took this picture today Mark and I um, he wanted to go fishing so we went up to Rob Roy Reservoir and there's a patch a huge patch of pasque flowers blooming on the little road that goes from Rob Roy Reservoir up to Cinnabar Park, if you happen to be up that way and look off down the hill to the right. So that is show and tell for tonight. Um, Marie, are you still there? Catherine, whoever wants to close out the meeting? Yep, I am still here. Okay. Thank you very, very much. That was a delightful You're welcome. program. Thank you for everybody for contributing. Um, I've been thinking maybe we during the growing season we should have um, a show and tell segment and you know we could limit it to your best three photos and get more people involved or something like that. Um, it's I think fun to see where people garden and what they're doing. Um, you know, quilt guild you can take your quilts to the meeting, but with um, gardening it's a little hard to do that. So, well, thanks we everybody. Also we can also feature vegetable gardens or oh right right but we're, or, we're not having a meeting in july so we'll have to wait till august we will uh, yeah for our picnic time <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay well we will see whoever wants to come to the executive board meeting on the 9th of july otherwise hopefully we'll have a picnic and we'll see you all there so thank you and good night good night Thank you. Night all. Have a good weekend. Have fun. You too.